conditions. So when I first um, said, oh, I'll take this chapter, I literally only thought there were signaling conditions. Um, and that's just the first part of the chapter. So we have errors, warnings, and messages. And those are things that as a function creator, you want to signal to the function user um, information. Then the other two are as function users, we can ignore conditions um, with either try or suppressing them. And then finally, uh, this is where I go over the deep end is handling conditions. So I don't wanna ignore it. I wanna get into the guts of these conditions and actually deal with them. And as usual, I thought the best way to learn these things was to write my own functions that use all these. And I use the beer data in a perfunctory way to do that. So first we'll go into our signaling conditions. Um, I really like this from the tidyverse style guide uh, about how to write an error and then this like uh, in parentheses, uh, like do as I say, not as I do. Um, so it's, it's thought provoking to think about what is an informative error message. So errors can be uh, thrown using the stop command. So here I've created a beer mean error. So rather than taking the mean, it, um, we're going we're gonna to kick out NAs and then calculate the mean. But you see here, if it's not a numeric, if you don't supply a numeric, column, um, it's going to say stop, you need a numeric column. And I put this line here after the stop just to convey that a stop is an exit strategy. So any code after the stop is, ain't going to happen. So um, you'll see here beam mean error. If I look at the barrels, it, it'll calculate um, the mean without the NA. And then when it fails here, um, because I'm trying to calculate the mean of states, you see our error, mean numeric column. Um, I also put this additional argument call dot equals false, because if you don't do that, then it'll look a little bit different. It'll show like this kind of part of the uh, trace spec um, inside the error. And if you want just a clean, neat error message, um, Hadley recommends sending that to false. So, that's base R's get out of this function. In Arlang, we can use the abort function, and this gets super cool when we go off the deep end, but essentially what's rad about it is that you can attach metadata to your um, exit strategy. So this is the same function, but rather than have the message like that, we can we set message equal to numericom. And then uh, just for the sake of adding metadata here, I added the, the column name. So again, you see the same story here in terms of success and fail on the bottom, but um, we can attach metadata to our stop. So I wanted to put this together with glue, which is fancy paste where you can um, write out a whole string and in curly brackets put the variable so rather than it like printing literally column name it's going to print um, x right so i believe this is called interpolation writing like that uh, but it's just easier than paste comma blah 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 so that's cool um, and in the support i'm going to store the message, the argument, and hell, why not? I can store the whole data that you're adding to this, that you're um, supplying as an argument to the function. So I changed the function a little bit where now we're supplying two things, the data and the column as a string. Um, and you see the same pattern here, right? We're just slowly building. I wanted to show you that if you look at the structure and use catch C and D, um, condition, you will see all this metadata that you've attached to your error. So that's really cool. And just put this in your back pocket because we're going to go 
ham with this in the end of the talk. So that's it for errors. Does anyone have any questions? Cool. Warnings, unlike errors, your code here is going to run. Um, it's not going to exit. It's just going to throw a warning. And as the book says, it's somewhat challenging to place uh, between messages like you should know about this and you have to, and an error where you have to fix this. Um, so in trying to come up with a somewhat plausible example, I changed the year column to a, like using Luberdate to an actual year. And then I created this function is date, which taste, which tests for um, a POSIX XCT, whatever, um, column. So if you're going to try to take the mean of a date, we're gonna throw the warning, are you sure you wanna calculate the mean of a date? That's weird, but you're still gonna get the, um, you're still gonna get the mean, because maybe you want it, but that's bizarre. Um, okay, so that's kind of all I got on warnings there, towing that line of TMI flooding the console. And then we move on to messages, which are like even lower down the totem pole, but you're just giving your, um, the person who's using the function, uh, information on what's going on. And I kind of stole this from Geom Histograms default 30 bins, where I'm making this summary function. So it takes on the data, the column that you want to summarize, uh, how many digits do you want to round your mean to? And then another argument, quiet, because the book says that you should have the option to shut up your messages. So our first condition here is if it's numeric, if it's not numeric, and we're going to error, uh, we can't calculate the mean of something categorical. Then if we don't supply a, a how many digits we want to round the mean to, we're going to, and the user didn't specify that they want to quiet the message, then we're going to spit out this message, uh, round to an argument no, and we're going to round to two digits by default. So that's what you see here, we're, running, we're rounding to two. Otherwise, you're going to round to the user specified number. And then here I'm just showing you, you can take, this is not only calculating the mean, I figured why not, if we're going to calculate, if we're gonna remove NAs, we should report how many um, NAs were in the data. So um, when it works, we have rounding two digits by default, a little tibble here, and then I just showed setting quiet to true. We don't see the message in the console. Okay, so that is, as a function writer, how to convey you got to stop. You probably don't want to be doing this, but maybe you do. That Warnings are kind of great at me still. Um, and then a message of like, whatever. Um, I think warnings, the book says it's nice to do if you like are, I'm blanking on the word, but you phase out a, a function and have a newer version of it. Like for pivot wider, if you were to do uh, spread, maybe it'll say war warning, we have a new function for this. Okay, so now I am pivoting roles to a function user, and I want to run code despite errors and make it shut up and go away. I just want it to work. So I'm using a try here where we're going to harken back to our first example uh, using abort um, and then just try it. And if it doesn't work, you get the silence is golden. This looks like a nice thing to maybe use in a long for loop perhaps. Um, I was reading the documentation on try and it kind of looks like it's a wrapper for try catch. I don't, I was hard pressed to find an example 
in my mind, where you would use try instead of try catch. So if anyone has any advice there, um, I put that in the Q&A. We could talk about that later. Okay. This one also, I was very, I, I, when I'm making this presentation, I want to gather a people. I want them to actually be like real life, when would you use these things? Um, and what I thought about for suppressed messages, and I could be totally off because I've never done this, is writing, when writing a unit test, if you have a whole suite of tests in a package that you're building, you want silence is golden, nothing, not all this, a log of a bucket of messages. So I created this little unit test where I compare the base mean to that of our summary stats mean, and I'm testing that they're equal to each other. Um, if you're not familiar with unit tests and testing doesn't matter, it's just, I, I, have my function and then I have how to calculate it in base R and then I expect that they're equal and I put suppress message here in order to just have the test pass bingo bango no clutter out but I don't know if this is even the best pra practice maybe you want to spit out all the data um, so if anyone has any examples of when they'd like to suppress messages um, that's also welcome. Okay. Does anyone have any questions there, comments, concerns? Okay. I used to use the suppressed messages, I think, um, the deployer join, and whenever I just didn't want to specify all the names and um, all my columns that were like the same column names. I think, I forget if it was suppressed messages or suppressed warnings, that one. But sometimes I have like, I don't know, like 10 columns and I just didn't want to see the join by whatever, all these 10 columns. That um, totally makes sense. <laughs> Anyone else? Moving on. Speak now forever, hold your peace. Okay. So handling conditions. This is when I went from, ooh, I got this. This chapter makes sense to that like, you know, the meme of the little puppy dog and fire and everything is fine. Um, I found these examples to be too example-y. Like I couldn't really extrapolate when we're going, when like the context in which we use with calling handlers and try catch. And Hadley has this article that's like insane that I read once and probably need to read three times to really make sense. Uh, but I'm just going to like blab and be very honest about what I don't know, but I try to make this work. Um, so if you basically R is cool, period, because um, if you have function A that function B is reliant on and mega function C is reliant on, if a condition fails, function C is screwed if A fails, right? So R breaks this up into, you don't just have a one, like conditions going down, you have, it's like a three-step iterative process of there's a condition, how do you wanna handle it? And then there's also this function that we're gonna dive into called with restarts, where you can tell function C, the like big global function, how to deal with certain errors. And um, yeah, it's pretty cool. So I'm still trying to grasp like this breakdown of it's not just conditions, but condition handling and restarting. It's this three step process that we can manually go in and this is how I type, um, deal with. So try catch, try catch it. For this example, I, you have your function that takes on an expression. And in the case where it's an error, I want you to throw an A. And in the case where it works, I didn't want to just throw in the expression. I wanted to show you all how you can build on the expression. So like you can, here I'm adding a string and even rounding it, right? You can do stuff further to the expression. And then there's finally, which, 
regardless of it passing or failing, you're always going to spit out this code. So my question on this try catch, so I'm trying catching beer mean abort, which it's going to work because when we take the mean of barrels, but it's going to throw an A when we try to take the mean of a state. And my question was, why is the finally happening first? My mental model would be average and then finally, and that could just be because I'm a human being reading the code downwards. I was curious, does anyone know why that is printed first? Mm -hmm. Food for thought. Okay. So um, I am a loop noob and was very excited about try catch because we can use this to not error out of a long computationally expensive loop. You can just throw something else out if your code errors instead of me hard coding one through seven and then do nine through 12. So try catch is awesome. So here I created this loop where we show where we're going to take the do those summary stats again um, and also give us a message if the, the number of iteration if it was successful or in the case of an error we're going to print the message caught an error on that iteration so we can use try catch within a for loop um, to catch errors without breaking the loop so that's I thought that was nice. Cool. All right. So, R's error handling system lets you separate the code that recovers from an error from the code that decides how to recover. You can put recovery code in low level functions, right, like that function A, without committing to actually using that recovery strategy leaving that decision to the high level function this is in that article i'm sorry i didn't cite it i'll add that that in the beginning of the chapter heather says oh i wrote this thing um and i wanted to dig into this so i i really really did so i have two examples and i included the code for these examples in the repo so people can play with it because i i am like five minutes ahead of people who aren't familiar with this code and would love to have a better understanding of it. So my first use case was I have an expensive function that I want to like run some neural net fancy expensive thing and then I just want to like plus one like do something stupid to it after but the plus one can cause me an error and I don't want to have to calculate that whole neural net again so what we're going to do is we have um, a function that we're also going to supply as arguments a warning and what to do with an error so in this case we're going to print the warning itself and then pop you into the browser and in the same case with an error we're going to print the error over to the browser so here's my super expensive function. I just assigned the thing to a new variable name. Um, and then I have with calling handlers, we're gonna start in the inside and work our way out. With calling handlers, we're gonna attempt to return the log of Z and um, warning equals warning and our error as we specified above equals error. So in this first, first with restarts, I assign, I call it force positive, where you're gonna do this, where you're going to assign Z as negative Z, because if we use, a neg if we try to take the log of a negative number, it's gonna error, so let's make our negative number positive, and then the code will work. Um, or we can set it to one. So in the case that, as you'll see, we're gonna set, expensive function to a letter then we'll just if it's a character set it to one um, so I'm wrapping this we re, with restart in another option of restart and that's why we have to have repeat but 
like my understanding of this is so perfunctory. I don't know if I could have just put these both in a singular restart. Um, and this example is taken from uh, this link here. <clears throat> I just wanted to like super deep dive into it. it they like drive by this. Okay, so high level expensive function, then try to take the log of it. So in the case of two, we have our big expensive step, x is equal to two, then our cheap operation, cool, we're taking the log. In the case that we have a uh, negative number, it pops us into the browser and we can invoke restart force positive, right? Because we gave that function the name force positive. So this is kind of like, so then we're telling the function how to recover, right? I want you to do force positive. And now negative two becomes two, two can take the log of, we're happy. What about expensive function A? Kicks you into the browser and you can invoke the restart set to one. Cool, cool, cool. So can you go back one slide? Yeah. Yeah, let me just, um, all right. Okay, so, uh, all right, so set to one is, and what was the other restart? Um, wait, so set to one. Force positive, other? force okay. positive and set to one. So if you supply negative two, mm -hmm. you can't take the log of negative two. And then if you supply A, you can't get the log of A. So we're just gonna, any character we're gonna set to one. Anything mm -hmm. that errors, we're gonna set to one. And anything that gives us that warning, we're going to negative. Okay. okay. And again, I have this code in the repo. Feel free to play with it. And like the more questions you ask, the more questions we have for the future because I'm probably not gonna be able to answer them. Um, but I thought this was really cool. So the next question here is, well, this is annoying for me as a human to have to pick the restarts to invoke. Ha, don't you worry. Remember in this function where we put here print and then pop us out to the browser, we can use anonymous functions and just put it right here. In the case of a warning, I want you to invoke this restart. And in the case of an error, I want you to invoke this restart. Bada bing, bada boom. Look what we have here. No manual needing to go into the browser. So this is a lot. <laughs> yeah. I, sorry? Can you spend like five more, 10 seconds more on this? Okay. All right. Yeah, 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 of course. Um, I, I forget that like, because I've been looking at this for a week, you have not. <laughs> okay, all right, so. It, it remembers so it, the force, I guess, yeah, you had force positive and set to one. I thought there were variables to like your prior error handling. Yes, oh, okay, yeah. Sorry? Like, yeah, I guess uh, so. Your quote, your in the slide uh, ahead, you have that quote in like force positive. So it's like looking up the name in the restart and then saying, okay, so, call me that. So we can dig in to the source code of invoke restart. That's like exactly the nerdy direction I would love. Um, but it's like we're going, we're going in to the rabbit hole. But yeah. Yeah, I guess my high level interpretation is like it's kind of treating the quoted variable as like a name almost and like it, it goes back to the function and sees that you've got the handler name as that same quoted name. Maybe I'm not making that sense. Yeah, like is there like a list of restarts and, and there's like a key? Is that a sensible question? Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of on the same like line of thinking there. It's like a lookup of the the named restarts that you have. Yeah. Okay, yeah, this is like beyond anything I've ever used, so it's gonna be a little unfamiliar. Mm. Is, is Tony Sharon? I think we lost Maya. Let's uh, give her a minute to uh, hopefully reconnect. 
I'll say I do think that there is somewhere like a list of restarts that when you call with restarts and you pass in a new restart, it, there's some like restart registry uh, that you can call any of those from. I think there's, you know, there's one restart, I think muffle warning that is globally available, but isn't actually defined in our, I think it's like in the actual source code. Really, it's like not a warning. You can call that restart at any at any time, and it would work. <laughs> Interesting. I'm not positive on that. I know. I know if you call it with the restart, I'm like you haven't defined it. I mean, it will have been defined. I think. Yeah, but I think you can call like with calling handlers and use muffle warning. Uh, if you look into the. Yeah, I see one that's muffle message that appears to be defined as well. Yeah, maybe that one. Yeah, I don't know if there's one or both of those, but uh, I think those are like the only ones that are always defined. And then everything else you kind of define yourself. I'm not, I'm not sure if, because I jumped in kind of late, if it was discussed yet, but was there any mention about when you're calling these restarts, what environment the restart is being called in? Yeah, no, I don't think we talked about that. Yeah. You know. Just tried sending Maya a note directly via Slack, but you know if she doesn't have connectivity here, she may not have it there either. But uh, we'll see. Well, here she is. There she is. Hey, sorry. Of course, my internet has been fine all day, and during the presentation is when it fails. Thanks for sticking just, with me. It was just testing your ability to handle errors. Got. Ah! <laughs> Good one. Okay. Um. Can I? Sweet. Yeah. Okay. I just had to redo that. Let me know when you can see my screen again. We can. Got it. Awesome. So this example um, was good. That like it, I, I, I see this intrinsic connection between invoking restarts and with calling handlers um, that I did not get from the chapter. And even the chapter says like, ah, there's restarts, but we're not going to get into that. And of course me, I'm like, I've got to get into that. But I wanted to explore this in another way, too. Um, and I wanted to create an example where, as you see from this quote here, we can use the condition system to allow low-level function to detect a problem and signal an error, to allow mid-level code to provide several possible ways of recovering from that error, and then high-level says, I'm going to pick this recovery strategy. So the way that I was thinking about this is you have your like junior programmer who creates a function and they're like, uh, this errors, I don't know what to do. And then you have your mid level who's like, okay, if something errors, we could either do this or this. And then you have your project manager who says, yeah, I have the domain expertise enough to know that this is how we need to handle this error. Let's use, one of medium functions up like the the manager knows which one of the mediums to use so that's kind of like my mental model right now of these three functions um and maybe that's wrong we can 
happy to talk about that. Um, someone asked a question about what environments these restarts are called within. That is a horrifying question. I have no idea. Because functions, right, have their own environments. We're, we're going to have to, like, I don't know. I don't know. I just um, wanted to note it so that it wasn't something we lost. No, it's, it's a great question. Definitely have it on the clipboard. I, I just, I don't even know how to, like, play with the environments of this. I am, I'm like, like I said, I, I might be, like, five minutes ahead of the We're people. right there with you. Sweet. Okay. But I like that question. Hadley, help us. Um, cool. So my intern is going to be this, what I'm calling a simple mean function. Then what if we have a categorical column? I want to say, well, let's, let's like get the counts of that column, the frequencies of um, the unique variables in that column. And then mean or count is going to say, okay, we're going to either take them, we're going to deal with the error in this way. So, simple mean, right? This is like the, this is pretty much like the function that we started the talk off with, but now in our abort, I'm giving this abort a name called categorical column. So, Remember our metadata in the beginning. Um, it, we also have the message, not sure what to do with a categorical column. And then we have our metadata of said column. And then I wanted to return the string that we're returning this number from simple mean when it works. So we're getting the mean of beer states barrels, simple mean error. This is just like the code we saw before, but now again, we've given this abort a name, which is really an S3 class of the error. So I think, I started looking into the classes of errors and I think we can get into this after the S3 chapter a little bit more, but the bare minimum error is called simple error. And that class is higher than simple warning, right? Which is higher than simple message but you can create your own, just as you can create your own S3 classes, you can create your own error classes, and we're going to leverage that. So we made this class. All right, now we have our medium workaround. So we have, our, we're using with restarts now, where we're going to try out using that simple function, and then we're using, we're gonna create a restart with the name categorical column restart. We're, we're going to count the uh, column. So in the case of states, it'll give us 50 Arizona, 20 New Mexico, whatever. Um, and then again, a string returning from mean count. So when this fails, it's just gonna fail we can pop ourselves into the browser like we saw before and apply our categorical column restart. But instead, I just wanted this to live as a medium function. High level function is going to do the work here. So high level function takes, oh, sorry. Um, oh yeah, no, sorry, I did describe that we're taking the count there of the variable. Okay, so high level function is gonna take medium, which inherently takes lower. Um, and in the case of an error, if it inherits the class categorical column, the error, then we're going to invoke the restart of categor categorical column restart. If we were to include other errors, like it'd be cool if someone wants to build on this code. Um, I don't know what those other errors would be, but if then we could give them their other classes and then invoke restarts based on the class of those errors. Um, otherwise, if it's just an error that of not a special class that we've denoted, I still want you to kick us out and throw an error 
I unfortunately couldn't think of uh, a column that would make this fail because pretty much catches everything as either a numeric or categorical. But as you see here, now when we run our success story, it goes to mean count, mean or, mean or count, the decider right here. It can go to the medium function, which goes to the lower function and all good, we get this count here. And then in the fail case, we see that um, it's mean count is going down, mean or count is going to mean count, sorry. I was trying to give these informative names, but it all kind of blurs together. Um, it's going down to find the restart. And we see here, I just printed the head of a table. So this is like crazy, all new information to me. I am like excited by adding stops in my function. So this is like next level. Um, but I thought this was pretty cool and I hope I did a somewhat semblance of a good job, like just as a first pass, um, showing people the world of errors and how crazy you can get. Um, and then every time I question marked, um, the error, errors and like um, restarts, whatever, it takes you to this rdoc page with a ton of functions that it, it wasn't clear to me the differences in those functions until I started playing with these things. And as you see here, there's a lot of to-dos um, because we didn't cover all of these. Uh, so clearly just the tip of the iceberg here, right? Like here I have simple error warning and message. If you don't define a class, that's the default classes. I learned that. Um, we invoked restarts, but what does it mean to invoke restarts interactively? I don't know, you tell me. Um, but yeah, again, I hope that this was a good welcoming foray to um, the land of conditions. And yeah, that is all I got. I wonder if he covers the rest of those in the expert horror book. There's another book? No, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe he's got to write one. But I don't know when you would use something like restart description. That seems like it's probably like a package. Yeah, so and, and some of these could be like internals. Um, yeah. But I, and I think that um, the book, he has like that article that goes into some of this stuff that like 80% went over my head. But I think your regular R user um, can get away with not knowing this stuff. I just like am hungry for knowledge. But, but like, I don't, you know, this example, or rather both of these examples, I don't see myself implementing these, but they are cool. Um, I don't know what code, I guess I just don't have like a badass package that would need this, but it's fun to think about code that would warrant this. Yeah, I think he brings up like a like an API scraper. I think that's probably the most common use case for error handling like this. But even some of that, I don't think it's super convoluted. I think yeah, because you can use like a try catch for that exactly. <laughs> uh, I'm sure there are use cases for this kind of stuff. But yeah, it's. Uh, I think the base level knowledge of this chapter is is probably sufficient for even just kind of an intermediate R user. Definitely. Um, but I, I just thought it'd be fun to go down the rabbit hole. And since you're all willing to entertain my crazy, I went for it. Um, cool. Did anyone have any like questions regarding this or the chapter in general? I think uh, was it Tyler that asked the question about the environments? I don't know if Tyler, if, if he, he knows the answer, or if he was challenging all of us, I don't know. But yeah, I'm, I'm super curious about the environments in which these run. Yeah. That, that is like a, like a boosh 
I don't know. Dar Darren's an expert on environment, so. <laughs> I, I was just thinking that you could call the uh, current environment function inside the restart, right? Yeah, I guess. Um, that, I mean, there, there are functions that, that tell you where the current environment is. So, I mean, I think you could just stick that piece of code into it wherever you want to find out. Um, but yeah, that's all the thought I have on that. No, that's a good, yeah, that's a, that's a more step ahead than I had idea. I like that. We also were talking about while, while we were waiting for you to uh, come back online, we were talking about whether there are sort of standard restarts, like somebody mentioned like muffle message or muffle warning or something like that. Is there somewhere a list of like what the standardly defined ones are or? What do you, what do you mean? So like you had a couple of them there that you had defined like, you know, I don't know, make positive and set to one and Mm -hmm. but it somebody I don't remember who it was help me out here mentioned that they thought they had seen some that seemed to be like defined within oh like built in standard built in yeah built in restarts oh that's a cool question I don't know I'm like one day into knowing what the hell a restart is that's really I that's cool what would a default restart be how would your code know how to how to fix it don't know That's, i mean it's an interesting i don't know this a uh... This chapter didn't cover um, like the per functions for like safely and quietly. It says that we're going to talk about safely later. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's those functions are the ones I, I more commonly use. Um, maybe we can do a comparison at some point. So uh, with this approach. Yeah, that'd be interesting. I think. I think a lot of that stuff is a wrapper, so you don't have to deal with any of those shenanigans. But I don't know. Yeah, uh, I think that's that's kind of my understanding of it too. I forgot to pre-build the book of questions, um, which I guess we can try to get to in the last 10 minutes here. Yeah, Darren, I'll, I'll just like shove that current environment in every step and add that to the Slack after so people can play with that. But what scares me about environments is like, do I do this in R, not the IDE? Because there's like confounding stuff if we do this in our studio. Wait, what do you mean by that? Like, I remember when we were playing with copy on modify, there was like an extra copy happening in our studio, but not in just like the GUI. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that might happen. Sorry, thanks for bearing with me here. Okay. All right. I bet this gets really tricky in our markdown where it's like you already have chunks that are kind of that can operate as their own environments and then yeah. it just like adds another layer of complexity. Yeah. So my first question was does anyone know when they would use try over try catch? No, I mean, <laughs> I'm kind of with you on that. I would always use crypt try catch, even if you really, I guess if you really had no idea what you would do with the exception or on an error and you just want to save some headache, yeah. you could just skip over it. 
but I, mean, I, I always just try to catch if I'm going to use a trolley. Yeah. That makes sense. All right, so this question says, um, this code from the chapter, it's a simple try catch here, and then it, the quote, the protected code is evaluated in the environment of try catch, but the handler code is not. Can someone just, I, I think I kept switching them up. Is the handler code what's inside the curly brackets or is this the handler code? Like what, which one is the protected? Which one is the handler? When you're saying this, by the way, I'm not seeing your yeah, I can see. screen right now. I'm oh. Not sure what you're looking at. It's oh, saying that sorry, it says I was sharing. Mine says that you're, you are, but it's just a black screen. Oh, awesome. Um, let me stop sharing. Let's redo it. Okay. Okay. Right. There we go. Sweet. Okay. We're in the totally wrong chapter now. Thanks for that. Um, now can you see it? Yes. Okay, yeah. yes. okay so it, it's just semantics, but is this the protected code and this the handler or the other way around? The Hmm. Uh, wow, I didn't even think about this that hard when reading through the chat. I just wanted to like, as uh, since I was a presenter, I was just trying to like think about words to use for these. I realized that we all kind of have this notion. We know what's going on inside the try catch. I just wanted like words. Um, Is this related to the... Uh, Earlier in, the, earlier in your presentation, there was a question of why the NA printed after? Yeah. Is that related to, is, was the NA the, the handler? That would make this the handler then. Because this was NA in that example. Yeah, so. So I, I have it backwards. I, yeah. I'm wondering, you know, if, if it's a, you know, if, if the answer to this question and the answer to that question are actually the same. Which Probably. Is, um, which is that a protected code has, it runs in a try catch environment and then, but. Um, so the handler code happens after the protected? After, yeah. Um, and what, and that would make sense in the second question here, why finally happens because it's in handler land. Is, is it in handler? Okay, well, yeah. the bottom, the protected part. Yeah, yeah, it's it, right. It's in, well, that's, okay. I mean, this is all guesswork on my part, but. Um, I think that makes sense to me. So handler happens before protected. That's weird. I um, think it's like the opposite. Well, <laughs> I okay, think so that the thing within the curly braces is the protected code, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. That, well. I, I definitely like my idea of an answer. I like flip them back and forth enough times to be like, eh, I think I need to ask the chat, the, the group. Um, uh, Jim. The bear no. doesn't look very protected. It looks very exposed. Um, yeah. <laughs> Put a code on. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, Jim says the example from the book. Um, yeah, I was trying to just build on the book. I, but that is a totally valid example. Um, but I could also see using try catch for that same example as well. Okay, um, I did not talk about like bubbling and muffled at all because I am very confused about those things. Um, So I guess going to this, if I have two different like bubbling muffling from the book and someone is generous enough to explain these to me, perhaps it will shed some light. So 
one, we just talked about protected versus handler. This output is handler, protected, handler, protected. That's crazy to me. The handler runs after every single line? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm wondering if this relates to like how I think Adley had an example where it's like a warning. Uh, if you have like three warnings in a, a function block, all the warnings print out like after the other print statements. Whereas the messages always like print out immediately. So if you have a message print, message print, message print, it'll print out exactly in that order. Um, so it's like, maybe it's like a behavior message. I, I'm wondering if you did the same thing with warning, would you see that the same exact output? Interesting. So, so it's not the calling handler. It's the fact that we're using message here. I mean, it could be the calling handler. I'm just kind of hypothesizing here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Jim also threw in the chat whenever it sees message, which corroborates your hypothesis. So, okay, that's me not understanding what messages are. Cool. Um, that is a very, like, nuanced detail I only learned when reading this chapter, so. I, I, there's I a lot of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, maybe I'm off base here. But to me, muffling sounded like suppress warnings. Are, is, how are they not the same? They could be totally different. I would... So Jim just threw in the chat the difference between try catch and with calling handlers, but I'm asking about muffling versus suppress warnings. So he, I think he was showing like muffling in the context of the handlers. I guess I just think of suppress warnings. Uh, I, I don't know. Would you use that in the context of handlers, like a with calling handlers type of statement? Or I mean, I've I've seen it mostly just you know, out in the blue, where it's just, you know, suppress the warnings on this one line of code. Um, so I, I don't know if there's, if that's just a stylistic thing or if there's actually some functional difference with, you know, muffling inside of calling handler environments versus using, a, you know, the suppress warnings in just like any normal environment. Yeah, Jim, what do you mean by blunt? That's like, yeah. I also, I think my questions here are, oh, I see. Um, um, I think my questions here are like predicated on, I don't really get what bubbling is. Is that you have like a error inside an error inside of an error and it, I mean a calling handler inside of a calling handler and the error like goes up the levels? It like ends up executing everything, even if there's a handler, like a nested error, instead of just jumping out of that. Yeah. So not to put you on the, the spot, but like if someone can come up with a bubbling something, because I feel like the book was avoiding bubbling, that would be like a very good visual for me as a not advanced programmer. <laughs> um, <laughs> So yeah, I guess I, I kind of just wanted a myth of like an example of bubbling, if someone can come up with that maybe. Um, okay, that kind of makes sense, but kind of not. Can muffle and or suppress both warnings and messages? I mean, I think there's a muffle warning, muffle message, suppress warning, suppress messages. So I think you can do either to either of those two types of but not errors, at least from what I'm poking around. Yeah. I guess, I don't know. Which makes sense to me. Um, this question is like a dumb one. Um, 
So we create this try catch for an error warning and message where you have some code run. Um, and the book has examples where you show condition for singular things, and that makes sense to me. Um, but then in this show condition, it has three things. Um, but the function itself only takes on one argument, the word code. Um, so like, how are you supplying three codes to a one code function? If that makes sense, a one argument function, you're supplying three things. And is that, are you allowed to do that just by virtue of curly braces? Is that a thing? Yeah, I think it is the curly braces that enable this. Otherwise, I would agree it doesn't really, uh, I mean, I'd have to run it in the console, but I think the curly braces is what- Allow you to do it multiple times. And is that true of like any function? That's pretty cool. Um, I would have, yeah, I would have guessed like using the ellipses here, that seems like a perfect case of just like passing any arbitrary bunch of things to a function. Yeah. Of just calling it code. Yeah. Yeah. That makes more sense to me. Um, cool. Okay. In the book here, um, they, the solution manual has an answer for what's happening here. Um, but again, I was really confused and I think my confusion comes from the message uh, function. So I think that makes more sense now that we covered that, like what messages do. Uh, do, do, do. Why, in this example, warning to error, um, we get the error, hello, but do, does this part happen? Yeah, I think so. Um, I guess we'd have to print out that part. What? what and like, how would you prove that it happened? Because X, I guess you can like super assign and, and try to see if X is a thing. Yeah, or like have your warning be about X. <laughs> oh, that's a better idea. Cool, yeah, I'll, I can play with that. Um, that's a good idea. And then this is getting more into muffling. Um, I started to see like, oh, we're using this here because if we didn't, it would print out A, B, and C and then do the stuff we want to do with it with the column handlers. Um, mm -hmm. It's like creating examples, which I think is too complicated for 703, um, whatever time it is in your time zone. Wow, mountain time zone, wow. Um, what is it, does anyone know what the signal function is? Is that an Arlang or? Yeah, that's an Arlang function. Oh, it's like a, you can, I mean, it seems like you can construct your own you know, uh, like message or in, uh, warning type of class using signal. Uh, at least that's what I'm getting from the help docs. Okay. I think I need to like let that marinate for a minute. Um, okay, I think that makes sense now that we figured out the protected code thing. Oh yeah, there was a section on interrupts and then it says there's no way to break out of the function if you captured the interrupt, if you use the like interrupt inside your function, can you're not able to exit it. I think the example was like 99 bottles of beer 
Um, and then like 98, 97, 96, but since you assigned an interrupt, you can't break out of it. Um, I was curious if anyone had any experience with what, what, when you would use interrupt inside your function or like the inability to interrupt rather, or maybe the book was saying you shouldn't do that at all. Yeah, I think it was saying you shouldn't do that, right? It'd be like an infinite while loop for you just run forever. That makes sense. And then last thing here is I purposefully in all the functions used either like beer states dollar sign barrels or beer states as the data set and then barrels as a string because we have not gotten into the Arling part of the book. But I happen to do a lot of work with that stuff. So if you wanted to um, write, rewrite all the code from this talk in like a more tidy verse style where you can use barrels and pipe it from beer states, uh, we'd have to um, finagle the code a little bit. Um, so I wanted to just apply that and I and say that like, I know how to do this. I just purposefully didn't because we're not there yet. So that's kind of, that's, that's everything. Um, I might try to piece together some answers from everyone's awesome comments and then throw things in the chat that are still fuzzy for me. Uh, Thanks everyone for indulging me as always. And yeah, I hope you learned something. Well, uh, I think last time you had a shiny up, I was kind of uh, expecting like, you know, like a whole parade or something. But I mean, I thought these two last functions were pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah, to be honest, it was like, I need to spend more time looking at some of that. I, I think yeah. I got most of it from your explanations. So I, I, um, both of those are our files in the presentation. Um, I thought those were more impressive than a dummy shiny app. Sorry. And I, <laughs> <laughs> I'll never impress you, Tony. <laughs> no, I'm saying it was, it was great. You set like the, you set the standard really high. Cool. Well, with that, I think, um, I don't have the GitHub page open, but we do have a presenter for next week, right? I think so. Cool. Um, I think it was 10? Yeah, I think so. Um, well, with that, thank you all very much, and congratulations to us. It's been eight weeks. So we're awesome and trudging along and yeah. Cool. Yeah, this is, this is good. Thanks. I'm learning a lot. Alrighty. Have a good night. And as usual, if you have like questions.